Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast, hosted by yours truly, Scott Howell, and the incomparable Bradley Flowers. For agents, by agents, we're here to share real life experiences, tips, and insights related to all aspects of both being an insurance agent and running a successful agency. So sit back, turn up the volume, and let's get down to business. Insurance agents from around the world, my name is Scott Howell, your fearless host of the Insurance Guys podcast. Welcome. I am the agency owner and insurance evangelist for I Protect Insurance and Financial Services based out of Huntsville, Alabama. Let me introduce, he's a great American, a fantastic agent, first team All-American out of Sarah Land, Alabama. Please welcome the incomparable Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? I'm great. I love it when you do that. Oh, I love doing it, brother. I love you. Guys, before we get started, let me introduce our guest today. He is a farmer's agent based out of Rochester, Minnesota. Did I say that right? Minnesota? Is that, is that about That's right? That's pretty close. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I want to introduce to you a, a farmer's agent who... Uh, who has had a viral video where he's paid parking tickets for people. That kind of went viral. We're about to talk about that a little bit. His name, Mr. Andrew Cooney. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today, brother. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, thank you for joining us. And let's start the show out. Before we get into anything else, we've got to hear about this viral video that you did. I heard about this from Bradley Flowers, my incomparable co-host. I guess it's been what Bradley six months ago, something yeah. like that. Yeah. When we, we first started the podcast, I said we got to get this guy. Yeah. On here, so. I, he he called me one day and he said, "Dude, we got to get this guy on. He he is he has rocked the world with this uh, with this viral video. Tell us a little bit about what happened, how you came up with that idea, kind of what happened after you 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 made the video and 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 how that all went for you. So basically, I had. Uh just taking the job with farmers. I think I'd been on staff for oh, probably about 30 days. This was my first ever office job. Mm-hmm. I wasn't used to sitting in an office all day. Wasn't a huge fan of that aspect of it, you know, initially. So I was like, you know, I gotta, I gotta get out. I gotta get doing something. Talked to one of my buddies and I should go pay some parking meters or something. I'm like, you know, that's actually like, he was you know kidding. I'm like, that's, that's a pretty good idea. So, you know, came up with the flyer and said, uh, you know, I paid your parking meter for you. Imagine what else I'm willing to do to protect your car. Mm-hmm. Went out, you know, just started doing, uh, I don't live in a huge town, maybe 120,000 people. Mm-hmm. So I went around and uh, started paying off these meters, leaving the flyers. Next thing I know, I get uh, a couple of my buddies messaging me like, hey, man, you're going viral. I'm trying to read it. So I, you know, look into it and really it blew me away. You know, that's the last thing you expect when you're just doing something to get out of the office for a day. It, it was all pretty cool. Definitely, uh, Blew up a lot quicker than I ever would have anticipated. Now, at the time that the that the video went viral, tell me a little bit about you and your agency. Were you a one man shop at that time, and you're just looking to gain traction? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm actually I'm still a one man shop. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been building my base. You know, it's been very successful. Uh, I really got attributed to that video. That um, I think it was funny. Junk was the first one that posted it. Then you know, once Reddit took it, it was just when Reddit gets a hold of something, there. it's it's game on. Right now, we spoke to Joe McCloskey, mm-hmm. the farmer's agent that ate the fish. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. We spoke with him, and, and he said that he posted that video, and within 24 hours, he had to lawyer up. Did you have to run into anything wow. like that? No, no. I was, you know, I was really fortunate. The uh, farmer CEO, he actually ended up uh, reposting it. You know, gave me kudos. Like after being an agent for 30 days, that's uh, you know, that's some uh, recognition you weren't uh, expecting to get. So that was that was fantastic. And everybody, not everybody, but most people on the internet were uh, positive about it. There's always going to be those, you know. Oh yeah. Naysayers out there. The uh, you know, you could save a basket full of cats in a river and you're still going to get you know people are going to hate on you right. but uh overwhelmingly positive one of the funniest things i saw from that is uh, are you familiar with insurance soup yeah okay i'm in insurance soup i don't know if you're in there someone posted um a news report that talked about that and i, I don't remember the news station but if i remember correctly it was a pretty well-known news station and and somebody commented and said this is the most gangster thing i've seen the only thing that would be more gangster is if Andrew actually reported it himself to the news agency. And I want to ask you on the spot here, did you or did you not do that? Honest to God, I did not. No, it was a complete surprise. I'll be honest, I wasn't on, I didn't, I knew what Reddit was. Definitely didn't have like an account or anything like that. So definitely do now, you know, after what they 
did for me to help showcase me. I saw what uh, asset digital marketing could be. So I, uh, you know, jumped into that. Definitely tried to get a, uh, you know, solid foundation out there. But no, at that time, that was a complete surprise. But actually, the same day, there was a Facebook post. Just some right. local guy had stopped me and posted on Facebook, like, ran to this guy out in town. You know, mm-hmm. look what he's doing. And I, and I still out, run into so. it on Twitter. And I mean, I, it, I mean, it seems like every every few weeks it, it comes back up mm-hmm. where somebody shares it and, and they think that, that it just happened, you know, but it's probably going to live on forever. You, you know, I thought it was going to be, you know, 15 minutes, 15 seconds. And I think it was Tommy Chong shared it like a month ago. And I was like, my God, I, kind of <laughs> when it hit me, I'm like, you know, this, this is still around. That's crazy. You got Cheech and Chong. Yeah, you, know, <laughs> you should, you should, you should try to come up with with some kind of life insurance pitch for marijuana smokers and just, just roll with that from there. There you go. You're rolling with it. Yeah, you're already <laughs> off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about, did you see an uptick in business from this, Andrew? I mean, did, did you notice three days after it happened that you were getting a lot more phone calls to your office wanting a quote? Tell, tell me a little bit about that. So I did see an uptick in business. Really a dramatic increase. But um, most people that were contacting me, you know, they're out of state mm-hmm. and I'm only licensed in Minnesota. So I wouldn't actually be able to write them. But Joe McCluskey ran into the same problem. He was getting calls from as far away as Sweden because of the, the type of fish that he used. But he said one of the problems he had was he was getting lots of calls from states that he was not licensed to sell insurance in. The issue is they like your Facebook page. You want as many likes as you can get. You know, you're growing your business. Now, when a bunch of people out of state like it, Facebook has that algorithm on who gets to see what you post. Right. So now a bunch of people that, you know, I can't write are getting the views rather than local people. But at the end of the day, I would much rather have that influx of uh, recognition and, you know, getting your name out there. I think that's much more valuable than, you know, a single Facebook post reaching the right person in town because I, I don't see a lot of ROI on that. And l- let me ask you this. This 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 is a question that and I am so glad that we have you on this podcast right now, and I'm going to tell you why. Number one was the viral video uh, aspect of this, and I, I, I wanted to talk about that, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you that it went viral. I love the fact that you are a single guy, single agency guy in terms of, of you're there, by, you know, you're on your own, and you, you are a head cook and bottle washer. You are writing policies, servicing policies, and it's been a long time since I was that guy, but I remember being that guy, and it was tough. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk a little bit about you as an agent being there by yourself, head cook and bottle washer. Tell me, first of all, once you got into the insurance business, was it what you expected, or has it been a, a lot different than what you expected? You know, I uh, had a uh, my stepdad growing up sold insurance. So I had a pretty good understanding of what it would take. You know, he would always work, uh, you know, seven days a week. You know, you work around the client. So I, I kind of anticipated that coming in, but uh, once you're living it, once it's you, it, it definitely it, it takes adjustment. Like I said, you know, it, this was my first office job, so it was it was definitely a bit of a learning curve mm-hmm. initially. And you know, going viral so soon, a month in, I got that big influx, and you know, truthfully, I w- I didn't have the uh, expertise needed, you know, of like a seasoned agent to handle that. So I was really fortunate. A lot of people in my district, a lot of the, my fellow agents, really stepped up and uh, you know uh, served as mentors for me, and you know helped me handle the, uh, the workload there. Right. So uh, definitely couldn't have done it, you know, without all of them behind me. Right. And I guess, and kudos to them for stepping up and being a mentor and coming in and helping you out with that. Now, where where are you today? Are you getting ready to hire your first employee? Are you are you still going to kind of sit in there as the as the guy for a while? What where are you at in that process right now? You know, I'll I'll hire people um, case by case, night by night, mostly just for. Um, telemarketing, going out there doing flyers, stuff like that for me. Just, uh-huh. you know, give, give me a night with my kids kind of deal. But as for like a part-time or full-time position, I uh, I don't I don't think I'm close to that yet. I uh, uh-huh. still got a, a book of business that I can manage myself. Uh-huh. And, you know, until it really starts cutting into my family time, I'm uh, probably going to try to keep it that way. Right. I understand that. Go Scott's ahead. getting excited at the one-man shop thing because cause really you are the model agent that we created this podcast for, how, how to go from start to, to prospering. Absolutely. And not only that, I remember what those days were like. I remember those 15-hour days. 
I remember not having anybody there to help me with billing accounts and changing autos out and, hey, it's Sunday and I need to see you. And, you know, there's not oh, – yeah. you can't send anybody else. You, you're the guy. And, and it, that is very exciting to me. Uh, there's part of that that I miss being there. You know, I, I know it's tough. It's tough financially. It's tough. It's tough all the way around. But there's also, a, a, to me, there was just a, man, I, there was a part of it that I really, really enjoyed. That I guess that's all of that's probably why I'm so excited to have you on the on the podcast. Now, let's talk a little bit more about guerrilla marketing. Have you come up with any new ideas? What other ideas as a single agent that's um, not got a huge budget, can't, you know, don't have anybody to help you? What other things are you doing right now in terms of in terms of guerrilla marketing? If we're talking about you know butts and seats, clients in front of me, face to face, getting them in the door. Mm-hmm. My most successful marketing tactic this far had been uh, would go out to I would announce it, give it about two three weeks that I'd be going out to the uh, uh, Dooley's local bar in town, and uh, I'd be giving sober cab rides, you know, from you know, nine to one a.m. And I got such a return on that, and you know it. So it you're Ubering? Is it, are you Ubering people? Well, he's, D, he's DDing. So, he's DDing. Um, DDing. Yeah. Doesn't, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't no, I, just drive up, I have a sign. Uh, I had a sign. It said, uh, "Good insurance will cover a wreck. Good insurance is going to prevent one. Uh, wow. Free rides." And I just sat there. You know, I would advertise it first. And I freaking uh, love it. I love it. That's it, so it something I would turn. do. That is that is guerrilla marketing 101. Now now let me ask you this: Did you give the people your card once they got in the cab with you and they're they're riding down the road. Of course, they've had a few drinks, and y'all are kind of laughing, and you're you're heading to their house. What did you do to get to get a, uh, you know, to give them your business card? How'd you do that? So I would always, you know, joke with them that I'm not going to shield you while you're, you know, inebriated in my backseat. I'm I'm not going to trap you like that. Right. And you know, I've always I'll always hand my card to a you know potential uh, prospect, Absolutely. but uh, I would get all of their numbers. You know, I'd be like, hey, love to give you a ride again sometime. You know, if it's ever needed, here's my card. And, uh, you know, like I mentioned, you know, working for farmers, love to see if I could help you out. And I want to say it was, I'm laughing right now. And out of 10, but it seemed like it. I can see Scott Howell sitting there and getting everybody in the car and turning around and saying, okay, guys, we're going to talk about insurance. So I get you home. <laughs> you ever heard of cash yeah, cab? Yeah. We're going to turn this into insurance cab. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like I, I did a deal where if I didn't beat your rate, uh, I bought you dinner. But what they didn't realize is they had to eat dinner with me and we're going to talk about insurance the whole time. <laughs> Absolutely. That's good. That's yeah. real good. So you would actually get their phone number, like you had a pen and pa- pad in your car, and you would like turn around and be like, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to bother you about it tonight, but I'd love you to give you an insurance quote. What's your number? And they'd be like, yeah, it's this, 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 and this. <laughs> They're drunk. They don't care. Yeah. Right. Is that right. kind of how know, that went? That's exactly how it went. And if you call them, I can't tell you how many people say, yeah, here's my number. Give me a call. And they, they don't answer. I'm not hearing from them ever again. Right. Now, if you say, hey, you remember me? I'm that guy I gave you a ride last Saturday night. You're adding that value to that service. You Reciprocity. Know, like you already yeah. did something for them. Right. And, and you know, I can, give see, you five minutes. I can see the the 64-year-old insurance agent sitting here thinking, well, that's not the kind of client you want. But but to me, I'm thinking the kind of client I want is the one who can go out and drink responsibly and, and know to take a ride home and not drive, right? Absolutely. There you go. Exactly. There may not be a cab company there, but have you gotten any flack from cab companies or anything like that that you doing that? So... I actually, I actually do drive Uber on the side. So that's how you get around it. I wasn't, yep. So I wasn't, you know, I didn't have my app turned on. It wasn't anything official with Uber. Yeah, uh, hopefully Travis doesn't listen to this podcast. It's no different than a regular Saturday night. Any other gorilla gorilla marketing ideas you've come up with that have worked? I love just walking into businesses and a local business and you start a conversation with the person. And I think that face-to-face value is beyond measure with what you're going to get out of it. Right. You know, you go into the local, uh, you know, paint shop. Mm-hmm. I need to get my office up to, uh, you know, we call it smart office standards. So I need certain shade, what have you. And he can obviously provide me a value. And I got something, right. you know, that could potentially help him. And I, I think just that yeah. individual interaction like that, to, real to, personal. I, yeah. To share ideas, you know, one one really cool guerrilla marketing tactic that um, I know a few local agents do here, but, but in particular one... Uh, politician, a good buddy of mine named Rusty Glover, who is uh, a senator in the state of Alabama or in the Alabama Senate and is actually now running for lieutenant governor uh, against someone from Huntsville, which is up where, where Scott's from. Um, one thing he does or has been doing for 20 years is every Sunday, all day, he gets a copy of the local papers and he finds clippings where someone's kid has done something good 
and he personally laminates them with a message on the back Mm -hmm. from Rusty Glover. And then he literally hunts down these people's addresses and and to go as far as as walking into local businesses and uh, and asking, hey, do you know any of these people? So not only is the person who get it who gets it going to think, but right. but the person in the business, and I know this because he's done it several times at my office, and I know there's some local insurance agents that do that. It takes a lot of work, mm-hmm. but and he actually just stopped doing that. Uh, he did it, did it every Sunday for 20 years. Uh, you know, running for lieutenant wow. governor is taking him out away from that. That's a that's a really cool tactic mm-hmm. that you know in, any kind of guerrilla marketing. I think if you're willing to to put your nose to the grindstone and put the work in, it's going to work. It's just the ROI is not going to be there immediately, but you are going to get, like you said, you are going to get butts in chairs. Right. Yeah. And Andrew, I guess the thing I would add to that is where we, where where guys like you and myself and Bradley. None of the three of us have a monstrosity of an agency. We don't have a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar marketing budget. But where we have leveled the playing field, not only with agencies but with companies as well, is is social media, and that now has become the new guerrilla marketing. Where Bradley and I will literally call each other on a weekly basis or text each other and go, "Oh my gosh, I've got the greatest idea." To, to me, that's the new guerrilla marketing of 2018, and that's how I can level the playing field against the state farms and the and the nationwides and the alphas and the Safeco's and all the other companies that are spending, you know, Geico that's spending, you know, billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. Is social mm-hmm. media has really and you did it. You hit one out of the park with the old parking ticket uh, viral video. You know, I'm sure every insurance company in America would have loved to have had that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's uh, Chris Paradiso, who was our guest on episode 13, uh, that, that said in a conference I was watching him speak at, Geico spent $2 billion last year to get your customers. Absolutely. What are you going to do about it? Right. That's right. That's our new guerrilla marketing. And I think uh, now that everybody has their phone surgically attached to their hand and laying beside their bed while they when they go to sleep, that that's where we have to focus the most of our attention. But... You know, I guess the other question I had was, what is the one area of insurance that you, as as a single agent in your office, that you kind of don't like as much as the other? Is it the working on billing accounts, changing out autos? Is it you know what what is it that that, that you have that you kind of struggle with? Because it sounds okay. like the pro- it sounds like the prospecting side, you're you're pretty a plus game on with that. Yeah, you know, I've I've never had a problem talking to people on the reasons I decided to get into the field. I think billing accounts, uh, servicing in in Mm -hmm. making a change to your policy. Mm -hmm. You know, I sat you down. I went, spent an hour with you explaining all this insurance in depth. And let's be honest, you don't work insurance. Yeah, it's in one ear, out the other. I hope they remember Mm -hmm. five minutes of that hour presentation I just gave them. Now, by the time you're taking that call off and we're, uh, you know, it's been, let's say, five months. Now you got all these questions and you're like, Mm -hmm. hey, that's not what you said. Like, right, you know. right, and I and I would rather we I'd rather this. I'd rather try to put leggings on an alligator in a phone booth than do billing questions. Love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's accurate. I, I feel the same sentiment. <laughs> then uh, commercial insurance too. I'll be honest, that's just one of the intimidating ones. Yeah, um, it, it's just me uh, walking in. Uh, this guy's put his whole life into his business. Why are you going to trust me? Right. I'm good at selling myself, but just the thought of that, all that blood, sweat, and tears. That's a big big thing you're asking somebody well and for me I, i've always loved commercial ever ever since i started in the insurance business i've always been a commercial guy and for for some reason but i'm exactly how you are about financial services and bradley bradley is the it, he's he's like you on the commercial side he is he i'd does, rather put leggings on an alligator in a phone booth i love that so much <laughs> um i have an x-rated version of it i'll tell you when we get there he absolutely hates commercial but for me, I'm, I'm the same way you are. And I'm going to tell you the same thing I said in whatever episode it was. What are you willing to give up to be successful? And what I mean by that is you're going to have to figure out a way to get over that fear and write commercial insurance because it could be, a, it could be something big for you and it could be something. And for me, it was, it's been a game changer. It's, it's changed my life, really. The home and auto side, love it. Love, love my clients. But 
man, when you get into commercial and you start writing big premium accounts, it can change your financial life. And so you're going to have to right. figure that out. Just like I've got to add the third leg of my agency, which is the financial services side. And I've said it on a previous podcast. I'll say it again. If I don't do it, it will be by far the biggest failure of my career is if I don't add financial services to my agency. And it, the commercial, the commercial landscape, and I'll tell this to everybody out there. And, I, and I'm this is not I'm not being boastful, but but almost. And I, I deal with three to five commercial accounts a year is what I do. I have I have several niches that I'm really good in. Outside of that, I refer it to somebody like Scott or, or you know someone someone else here local. But almost every commercial case I wrote in 2017 there was a buy sell life insurance attached at right. the end of that deal. Right. So it's a it's a very good way to segue into that financial services and those once you get in front of them on those buy sell agreements the pitch is do you want to do business with your business partner's wife or spouse? Do right. you, did they want to do business with your spouse? The answer is always no and hell no. And if you get both of those, it's okay. How much are we going to do, and how are you going to pay it? it yeah. You know, it, once you get in front of them, it's the easiest pitch in the world, and usually they're big policies, and they pay annually. And it helps you because you've got that financial services tagged on the back end, so you know that's coming, and so you're like, I, I can get, I can get okay with selling a little commercial to get to that. Exactly. I mean, one one of the cases I handled this year was a 12 car commercial account, which is a big commercial fleet for me, believe it or not. Uh, we ended up going uh, the progressive route. We went to progressive on that, and. I was think I was texting you. I was pulling my hair out. I mean, I was like, I'm I'm done with I'm, this. is so frustrating. I mean, it's you know, we ended up getting it. I'm like, hey, you know, and I asked her that question, and she said, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. And so it, it turned into to a really really huge case. Yeah. And uh, and and so you know, finding that niche, and I think that's one thing too that I would suggest to, to Andrew or anybody listening. If there's one line or one thing that you don't like to do because it scares you or just because it's a, it's a big a big elephant to eat, is just find that you know with commercial. Uh, one thing I found is I'm really good at commercial general liabilities on someone who owns ten plus rental houses, mm -hmm. or someone who has commercial, you know, a small amount of commercial. I'll just find that one niche and go for that and sort of build on that. Absolutely, sure. That one specific service or industry within the market right. capitalize on that. Right. Exactly. Sure. Of all the social media platforms out there, what's your what's your favorite one to post to? What's your favorite one to use to try to to try to bring people in? So it was Facebook. I, w I was getting. You know, pretty active on that. Had pretty strong following. I think I hit about 1K in you know my first month on Facebook. Then um, I had a bit of a hiatus, and I'll say you know, especially when you're a one man shop, when uh, yeah, I had some health issues going on, and I kept me out of the office a couple months. When you got to take that kind of time off, it is amazing how momentum. You are so heavily reliant on that if you want to be successful, mm -hmm. right. and it's probably the hardest thing to try to regain. You know, my big, my biggest piece of advice to anybody, you know, the first year, first two, three years, it's going to be a rough grind. As soon as you put your head down and, you know, you stop driving, mm -hmm. you're only going to make it harder on yourself. And, I, I was literally, you know, literally on Twitter between the last podcast we recorded and this one, and someone did one of those polls and they said, out of these five things, what would you be most devastated? What would devastate your business the most if they went down? And it was Gmail, Trello, uh, Slack, which a lot of people use for notification purposes, and Facebook. And I clicked Facebook, which is by far the answer. Mm -hmm. And that was the smallest. Hmm. But, you know, that to me, I would not be here today if it was not for social media. Mm -hmm. I, I really, truly believe that. Right. You know, that's how we connected. You know? Exa exactly. Me, me and you. I mean, the, right. world is small, the world is smaller. You right. know? And, and what's happening, and, we, and I think we've spoken about this on the podcast before, is what's happening is is back in the day in the 50s and 60s, how did you find your insurance agent? You asked your neighbor, hey, who, who does your insurance? Mm -hmm. And then what happened in this big advertising movement in the late 60s, early 70s with Madison Avenue blowing up as everything went to billboards and radio and TV and all that sort of thing. And then the consumers found out, oh, these people are actually selling to us. You know, Just because someone's advertising themselves as the best insurance company in the world does not mean they're the best insurance company in the world. And so what's happened is because of social media, everything's going back to word of mouth. Right. And everything's going back to posting in you know, local community groups and saying, hey, who, you know, who can I get for insurance and that sort of thing. So it's, it's bringing the world back together and bringing everything back to that word of mouth. Well, you agree? It, yeah, and not only that, and, and I, I preach this all the time, and, and sometimes people look at me like I'm insane, but, you know, these big box retailers, clothing retailers, artists, sculptors, painters, people who sell accessories for, you know, guns and, and, and knives and shoes and whatever – you know, for these big box retailers, it is death by a thousand cuts because 
you have people that that are selling the you know their products, their shirts, their shorts, their whatever on Facebook and Instagram, and they have a website and they have a you know and and so these big box retailers are going out of business, and and I, I think this year it's continued to be pretty heavily as far as people going out of business. And it's death by a thousand cuts because it's not any one, you know, one retailer taking them out. It's just that it's now fragmented so much that you've got a thousand different uh, small jewelry manufacturer, uh, jewelry people making jewelry. And that's taken away from the Macy's that was the one that used to sell costume jewelry. And, and it's, I, I think it's like that in a lot of places, but I am very... I'm very pleased that the three people that are on this podcast right now seem to have a pretty good handle on an understanding that you got to use social media if you're an insurance agent. And especially if you're an insurance agent that maybe they're the only one out there. You know, they're, they're the guy. And, and the, the personal branding side of that. And I, if, Andrew, I really feel like you get that. Oh, yeah. One of the big factors I like about it, it like you said, brings us together. It, um, it holds everyone accountable, too. Right. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you look at the reviews, you know, it, it, I might not know if this guy's got, you know, 40 five star reviews, one one star. You, know, you can probably understand, Man, you know, uh, maybe uh, one person mad. There's nothing, there is nothing in my day to day that would upset me more that could happen than a bad Google review. Uh, Other than somebody close to me dying or getting sick, and I'm speaking more business, I'm not speaking personal. But there is nothing. My biggest account could call me right now and say, hey, we're going next door. And I would not have as bad of a day as if I got a negative Google review. That is, and, I, and I've never had anything but a five star. And I know eventually it's going to happen. Sure. Because, I mean, if you try to oh, expand yeah. and scale, I mean, it's, it's going to happen. Right. I've had a bad Facebook review of somebody that was not my client. Don't care about that as much as I do Google because, you know, that, yeah. you know I get a lot of business from Google. I'm, that would completely shatter me. Mm. And that that's and one thing that, what the impact it would have on your business. Oh, and, and you know, I, I think consumers know that too. You, and you know, you, you they have, know right. they have that. And you have this, you know, everybody has that one client that they really just want to be like, you know what, you, you can go to hell. I, yeah. I've got a few. Of those. Yeah. Everybody's got that client. Yeah. And so honestly, for me, what it does is it makes me push just maybe a little, maybe be nicer a little bit longer because I'm, I, I'm not, you know what I mean? I don't want to, I don't want to. To, to get that bad, you know, that bad. And that might be a little bit selfish, but that's how I feel. Andrew, I'm going to tell you what I do. You're not going to believe this. Or maybe you will believe this. I know I know Bradley Flowers will believe this. But at the end of December of every year, I go in the office, I call everybody together, and I say, what five clients are we getting rid of next year? And I consciously spend January and February trying my best to figure out a way to get rid of these people. Because... I figure it's the 5% rule as far as they say to try to weed out the 5% of your, your clients every year that are giving you the most problems. But we do that right. every year. We, we try to find five people that we, we, we don't want to do business Here, with. Here's what you do, Scott. You open up a second agency. Right. And not only do you put all those clients at that agency, but when you ever have, have an employee that you want to quit, you just transfer them there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what you do is you call them and you say, we don't, we're not selling insurance anymore. We're out of it. Andrew, you got any ideas on what to do there, or are you still just trying to get them in the door, brother? You know, I'll probably keep them, but yeah, I do have right, a right. quote. I don't blame I'm you. Just thinking, I don't know what y'all are talking about. Yeah, I don't like, blame you, brother. I was there yeah, one day. I was there. If I was in Alabama, I'd, I'd gladly take these folks for you. I bet. But, uh, I bet. I, I got some buddies that uh, work for a different company. Whenever my quotes aren't competitive, you know, they, they send me the ones they just simply aren't going to win. Right. And I, that, and I do the same for them. You know, one of the best advice I would tell every new agent, is, and I've been doing this right at seven years, which is, is not a lot, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, but one thing I would tell every new agent is buddy up with your competition. Mm-hmm. You know, there's enough mm-hmm. business to go around. I mean, you need to be competitive and, and you need to want them to lose, but you need to try to build the biggest agency in town without tearing anybody else down. And I think, you know, some, some mentors I've had in the past, that's one thing I've learned from them because they did the opposite is, is they like, you know, spent time trying to break their competition down. And, and I think that, that having advocates for you that you can refer things to and that sort of thing is, is all the better. It, you know, we all need to stick together because, like you said, Geico's spending $2 billion to try to take our clients. Mm-hmm. And, and at the end of the day, we're all in, the, we're all in this together. Right. And, and that's, that's awesome that you're doing that. I mean, that's, that's one of the best things that you can do. And, 
and you know, and further have that agreement with them that, hey, look, if I send you this client for this, you don't solicit this and vice versa. Right. And you'll end up exactly. getting, you know, what I, one of the first things I did is, is I found an agent that only did commercial. And he hated to do personal lines, and I hated to do commercial. And I'd send him commercial, and he'd send me personal lines. Right. That's just, you know, it worked out really well. Andrew, I got one last question before we let you go, brother. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your goals. I want to hear what, you, what, what when when Andrew thinks about ten years from now where he wants to be in the insurance industry or business. What 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 are your thoughts? What are you where are you wanting to be? I want to be able to go to my son's football game, and not think twice about it, not mm-hmm. think about hey that meeting I'm not at because mm-hmm. I I don't I don't need it. You know, mm-hmm. I'd, like, I'd like to be comfortable enough where I could, uh, you know, work a nine to five and that's it. Just that, that comfortable living. It's not, nothing extravagant. I, I will tell you this. You got to you got to keep grinding. Don't stop. And if there's anything that I can ever do for you or Bradley can ever do for you, I can promise you pick up the phone and call us, email us, do whatever you need to do. And we'll help you any way we can. And I really, really, really appreciate you being on the podcast today, man. It means more than you know because I, I was unaware that you're a one man shop, man. And and to me, that that that's where it's at, man. That's that's my that's my jam right there. I love it, and I appreciate you being. Hey, on. I really appreciate. It. I appreciate the opportunity, and you know, I got to say, I know you guys are in Alabama. You know, I, I used to live in Mississippi. I was stationed down there mm-hmm. in military. Uh, so my time down there, man, that Crimson Tide really grew on me. So I got to say, congrats <laughs> to. Uh, Everybody listening in Alabama, that was beautiful. It, it, it was, but you are talking to two non-Alabama fans nah, right now. Listen. Oh my god! All right, I got <laughs> no, no, no. Listen, I, I have. I, I grew up about an hour and a half from Tuscaloosa, and I had a lot of friends that played Alabama. And, and Scott's and, neutral. Bra- I, I am much more neutral than Bradley is. I will say this. <laughs> I love it when Alabama wins. I love it when Auburn wins. I tell people we people in Alabama probably spend anywhere from ten to twenty million dollars more a year at Christmas when the University of Alabama is headed to a national championship because everybody's in a good mood. Nobody's calling mm-hmm. my office on Monday pissed off because Alabama mm-hmm. lost on Saturday. So man, I, I have my 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 crimson pom poms are out every Saturday. I want them to win every game they play. So, That's right. And, if, yeah, you'll, and if you'll if you'll listen, and all the listeners will listen to episode eight, we actually we actually uh, kind of did a synopsis of Nick Saban yeah. and the process and how to how to apply that to your business. It's it's one of the better episodes that that we've done, minus some construction work we had going on in the back <laughs> of the studio. Andrew, thank you so much for being on the podcast today, and uh, I'm going to close this out. And guys, remember, rewards come from action, not discussion. You need to stop sitting behind your desk, aggressively waiting on the phone to ring, and get your ass out there and go sell some insurance and make some money for your family. Write good business for the agency that you represent. Write good business for the agency and the company that you represent. And guys, have a great week, and we will see you next time on the Insurance Guys Podcast. Bradley, have a great day, brother. You too, Scott. See you next week. All right, see you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at iprotectins at gmail.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to bradleyflowersinsurance.com or email him at bradley at sarahlandinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to being with you again real soon on the next episode of the Insurance Guys. Take care.